Well, you didn't think we were just going to sing to Pastor Ron Baum after 15 years here on staff. We got him a present. The whole staff got together. This is office artwork. We're going to hang this in his office in front of him so he'll always be able to see it. And so I think he's, I think he loves it, I can tell. Um, so if you're ever just discouraged or confused, just look up, you know. So can you hang this in Pastor Ron's office? Thanks. Great. What a blessing. <laughs> well, today is what we call Palm Sunday. We're going to talk about why we call it that in a minute. We're taking a break from our John series, but we will be back in the Gospel of John soon to finish that book. But this is a day that starts what we call today Holy Week or Passion Week, and it's the Sunday before the crucifixion. And Jesus knows the crucifixion is coming. Everyone else seems oblivious to it. The religious leaders are definitely trying to take him out, uh, but everyone else is seemingly confused about what's about to happen this week. But since Jesus isn't, as we look at each of the sermons and conversations that he has this week, we should interpret them in light of the cross. He knew that he'd be sharing these ideas and topics with people, and then he would be crucified. So we're going to look at each day of this Holy Week from Sunday to Thursday. We'll save Friday for our Good Friday service. We've got a kids' ministry that day, too, so we hope that you can join us this Friday at 5 p.m. But today we're going to be looking at uh, Sunday through Thursday. Now, Sunday starts off exactly the opposite of how the week is going to end, right? Sunday is a day of expectations. Jesus enters the city of Jerusalem in such a way, with such celebration from everybody that we call it the triumphal entry. Everyone is applauding and, and screaming out his name, saying, yes, you're, you're the Messiah. But those shouts of praise are going to turn to shouts of crucify him by the week's end. Jesus comes, and, and instead of him being filled with joy, he weeps over the city of Jerusalem. He tells them, you have always rejected the prophets. For hundreds of years, you have rejected the prophets that have come to speak to you, and now you're about to reject your Messiah. So he's actually weeping for the city because he knows that there's consequences to, to rejecting the Messiah. Jesus is going to make his way to the temple, and he's just going to look around. He's going to observe it and then leave and go back to Bethany. So on this day... I think the main theme we see is one of expectations in this triumphal entry. Matthew chapter 21, verse 4, says this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. The prophet they're referencing is Zechariah, Zechariah 9.9. It's 500 years before Jesus is showing up on this day. said, say to daughter Zion, see, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus fulfills this prophecy. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them, and they brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. This word Hosanna is a figure of speech from Psalm 118 that means save now. They're recognizing that he is the Messiah, so they quote a messianic psalm, and they're basically saying, this is the Messiah, Jesus. Jesus had just raised Lazarus from the dead in John chapter 11, just a couple days before, and so that word had spread, and people realized, okay, that's the final sign. This must be our king. So after all Jesus has done, He's made the, the lame to walk. He's opened the eyes of the blind. He, he constantly hung out with people that were outcasts in society. After all of that, he finally receives his praise. He's finally worshiped as the Messiah. And it feels so right to read this passage if you don't know what the end of the week has in store. So why are they celebrating? They're actually celebrating because they have wrong expectations of the Messiah. They're confusing what Jesus came to do. They wanted and expected a Messiah that was going to come and lead them against Rome so they could be an independent nation again, freed from Rome. And that's not what Jesus was there to do. Jesus ultimately will exalt the, his people, right? But in this first coming, he came to deal with our spiritual problem before any national problem at all. So, 
their expectations are so far off, but it's resulting in praise. And I wonder if it's not important for us to look at our own expectations and think through, what do we expect from our relationship with God? What do we want from our relationship with God? There's nothing wrong with with wanting a, a healing from a health problem or wanting help, you know, for the Lord to get you out of a financial mess or, or hole that you're in, for wanting God to heal broken relationships. We can bring all of those things to Jesus in prayer, but what are, what's God's expectations about this relationship? As we draw closer to the cross, it helps us to fine-tune our expectations. It helps us to understand what God wants, and if, if we don't, if we base our relationship with God on our own personal expectations that we created, then we can be just as fickle as this crowd when things don't go well in our life. And when things don't go well, we want to blame God, but God has not failed us and never will fail us. Our expectations of God might fail us. Expectations are everything, right? You see that in many ways in life, but I think of, of how important expectations are in marriage. What do I expect my spouse to do or not do? Right, when we do premarital counseling here at the church, we'll have um, people fill out a Symbus quiz. It's called Saving Your Marriage Before It Starts. And some of the questions they ask are, who do you expect to do the laundry or do the dishes or manage the finances? We're going to put it on the screen. What's cool about this test is it combines it into a report. And on the left here, this, this is what they agree on. So when someone says, who's going to gas up the car? They say, well, both of us will. And both of them agree that both of them will do that. They have the same expectation. But it tallies everything they disagree with on the right. So who's going to do the dishes, take out the trash, uh, provide income, do the auto maintenance? That's something where they're both pointing fingers at each other or saying, no, I'll do it. And the other one's saying, no, I'll do it. And there's, there's a miscommunication in those expectations. So the goal is if you can talk about these expectations in advance, you could reduce your fighting by 1% in marriage. So it's significant. It's significant. Now, I've, I've uh, promised never to take that test. That way I can plead ignorance every Sunday when Shannon's like, do the dishes. I, this is the first time hearing of this, sweetie. In 14 years of marriage, I had no idea I, was, I should take that test, but then I don't ever do that. Expectations are crucial. The cross will surprise this crowd within a week. They will be surprised at the end of this story, and God's plans for us will surprise us, but they will always be better. The Bible says that, that, that God will do things that are exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. We should actually have bigger spiritual expectations of God than we do. That would be appropriate. And so as we draw closer to the cross, our expectations change how do we line up our lives with, with what God wants for us as far as our expectations? We do that by reading the Bible. We do that by studying the scriptures. And we need to interpret the scriptures in light of that climactic moment in history, the crucifixion. If the crucifixion was the main thing that happened this week, and my expectations are all about maybe health and money and relation. And, Maybe I need to be thinking less about my little world and more about God's kingdom and about my sin and, and forgiveness than I am right now. So expectations are so important, and I think that's Sunday's theme. Now, on Monday, Jesus comes from Bethany, and as he's, as he's coming towards Jerusalem, he sees a fig tree. Fig tree didn't do anything wrong, but Jesus is trying to teach his disciples a lesson so he pronounces a curse on the fig tree. He's not cursing out the fig tree. He's pronouncing a judgment or a curse on the fig tree. They're wondering what, what's going on here. But it, the fig tree is symbolizing the nation of Israel that is not bearing fruit. That happens. They're a bit confused. They continue on. And Jesus heads to the temple that he had observed the night before, and he starts clearing it out. He cleanses the temple. He's flipping tables and getting rid of the money changers. And we're going to look at some verses that talk about this in a minute. And then he goes back to Bethany. We see the description of what happened in the temple in Matthew 21, 12. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The key word for what Jesus is doing here is cleansing, 
right? He's cleansing the temple. Jesus inspects the temple to determine if it is fulfilling its intended purpose. Is it going to be a house of prayer and worship, or is, is it going to be a den of robbers? Well, Jesus found sin and corruption. Instead of the money changers being helpful and exchanging the foreign currencies for the, the temple currency, they're putting their interest rates through the roof and causing people to lose so much money that it is corrupt and that house is full of greed. Instead of those that are selling doves and, and, and lambs, just exchanging for the right amount, they're overcharging so much that some people couldn't even offer a sacrifice like they were supposed to. People are blocking the true worship of God because of greed, and Jesus is cleaning house. The main question is, what gives him the right? The religious leaders are thinking that, the money changers. What gives you the right to be so disruptive for our daily activities here? Who do you think you are? Well, Jesus is the one this temple is designed to worship. It's his temple. That's what gives him the right. It was the father of Jesus in heaven who told Moses how he should design the tabernacle and told King David how he should design the temple and how its purpose was to make it a house of prayer that worships God. Jesus is God. The house is not doing what it's supposed to, and so he cleans it. But here's what's interesting for modern believers. There is no temple in Jerusalem anymore. And so what does that mean? Well, we're told in 1 Corinthians 6, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. The temple is no longer in Jerusalem. It resides with each believer. God dwells with every believer. The presence of God, the Spirit of God is within us. He's with us. That's amazing. That's a gift. But then all of a sudden, we look at this passage of Jesus cleaning out the temple and we remember that he's in our hearts, and we realize, oh, no. <laughs> Jesus is going to have a similar desire for cleansing his temple, our hearts. And we've got to be open to that. And we need to confess our sins and invite Jesus to clean house of our heart because it's his heart. We were bought at a price. And as we draw closer to the cross, we see our need for a cleansing even clearer. We realize, man, the cross was necessary for my sin, Jesus, you need to cleanse my heart. We don't always recognize our need for a cleansing, right? I, you know, I look at my car as I drive to work. I'm like, ah, oh, it's fine. It's fine. I'll clean it next week. And, I, and I'll invite somebody from work out. I'll say, hey, let's go grab lunch today. You drive. And as we're walking under the stairs, oh, I can't drive. And I'm like, that means I'm driving. Wait, you wait by the elevator for 10 minutes while I get everything out of my car and put it in the trunk so it appears to be a little cleaner than it really is. Their presence made me think, ah, maybe it's not really as clean as I thought it was. One time uh, last year, there was so much pollen, and, and Pastor Ron looked at my car, and it was covered in pollen, and he said, you know, they make these things called car washes that you can go to. You give them money, they clean your car. It's a great deal. I said, yes, but those, those cost money, and in two months, it's going to rain, and that'll be free, and that'll be free. And so I think he wrote the word, wash your car in pollen, on my car. But it, you know, his presence made me realize I really do need to wash my car more. The cross helps us to see our own sin as evil because if, if something as cursed as a cross and a crucifixion is necessary to deal with my sin, I need to treat it as more wicked than I'm willing to give it credit to be. It, it's, it's worse than I think it is if a cross is needed. Well, that's not me. That's the Romans. That's the Jews. No, it's us. Peter tells us that Jesus bore our sins in his own body on the tree, right? It's each of our sins were represented there on the cross that Jesus died for. Man, my sin's a lot worse than I thought it was. I need to invite Jesus to cleanse me. And the end result of that is going to be great. It's going to be a painful process. It's going to be a long process, but the end result is going to be beautiful. Shannon, I think the women's ministry, my wife Shannon has a um, there's like a tea event coming up in May. And so she gathered some of the women's ministry leaders and they went to a tea house in San Juan Capistrano or something. And so she wanted to help carpool. So she was going to use our minivan, our minivan that has three elementary age kids in it, right? Like permanent peanuts in the carpet minivan. Well, that's not a good idea, but she went and got a car wash. And because these kids have been in it, 
She kept on texting me, oh, they're still working on it. They're still working on it. They're still, I'm so sorry, but they're still working on it. I'm like, I know how dirty that, that car was. When she got home, she said, this is the best money I have ever spent in my life. No child is ever allowed in the minivan again. So you could use the Ford Fiesta to drive all the kids around town. She's rolling around in her minivan like it's a sports car, you know, because it's so clean. It was worth all of that waiting and all that work. Listen, I know it's uncomfortable, embarrassing, and, and tearful to confess our sins to Jesus, but when we allow him to do that work of cleansing in our heart, it is absolutely life-changing. Now, on Tuesday, the disciples head back into Jerusalem, and they pass that fig tree that Jesus pronounced a curse on. It had completely withered. It was, miraculously was judged and died. You're like, man, this is harsh, but Jesus was showing them that a judgment was coming on Israel for rejecting their Messiah and for not bearing fruit spiritually, and that he was able to give that judgment. Jesus heads to the temple, and this is a day of controversy. People are questioning his authority. They're, they're tr trying to trip him up with questions. He faithfully and lovingly teaches them and continues to try and help them to believe in him. When he's leaving the temple... He heads out towards the Mount of Olives, so we call this next section the Olivet Discourse because it happened on the Mount of Olives. Here, I think there's no other theme we can prescribe to Matthew 24 and 25, a long section of Scripture from Jesus, than readiness. Readiness. We should be prepared. Prepared for what? Well, Jesus predicts the destruction of the temple. That temple that they had just walked past, he said, will be destroyed. Not one stone will be left upon another. That happened in A.D. 70 when Rome, Rome came and destroyed that temple. But Jesus also shares some signs of the end times, stuff that hasn't even happened yet that we read about in the book of Daniel, the book of Revelation, that Jesus is coming back again. He would be back momentarily with his resurrection and 40 days before he ascended into heaven. But the scriptures are clear that Jesus is coming back again. Jesus is about to die on the cross and he's reminding us that he is coming back and we need to be ready. Here's the problem. In Matthew 24, 36, it says, but about that day or hour, no one knows when it's coming. So we have to be ready for something we don't know when it's going to happen. So how can you be ready for something you don't know the time? Well, I've read, I think this was the New York Times, that some husbands say that even when their wife knows the time, they still won't be ready on time. Now, can you imagine me saying that last service when my wife's sitting over there? It was terrifying. I didn't look at her the entire, the entire time. But it's hypothetical. It's in the New York Times. You can't blame me for something that's in the Times like that. Listen, how can you be ready for something we don't know when it's coming? Well, Jesus says in verse 32, keep watch because you don't know the time. Okay, so we need to keep watch. Well, what does that mean, to keep watch? Jesus shares a few stories and parables to teach us what it means to be watchful. He talks about a faithful servant who was always ready and a wicked servant who began to like beat and hurt the other servants because he's like, ah, my master's never going to be back. Talked about a wedding that was about to happen and some people had oil lamps that were full and others didn't bring enough and they weren't ready to go to the wedding. But there's a story that I think makes it very clear what, what our lives should look like while Jesus is coming back. And it's in Matthew 25 and it's the, the sheeps and the goats parable. Jesus sets himself up as a good shepherd who knows the difference between a sheep and a goat. And one day he's going to come and he's going to separate true followers from false followers, from, from nominal Christians. Those who are like, yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian. But, and we might not be able to tell, but Jesus says, I know because I'm a true shepherd. And he says this, then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the inheritance prepared for you since the creation of the world. And then he, he describes really, really clearly what our lives should look like if we're waiting for his return. He says, for I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. And I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And the righteous feel really bad at this moment. They're like, that actually wasn't us, but we love you, but that wasn't us. We're so sorry, but we would, we would have done that if we knew that it was you. We would have done that. And the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you did for me. 
Jesus is going to remind them, we need to live as if he's already there. If Jesus were sick or hungry or in prison, we would take care of his needs. Jesus is saying, it is me. I, I, as you help those that are hurting around you, you're proving you have the same heart as God has. You're proving God is transforming you from, from being selfish to one who wants to bless other people. Being watchful is reminding ourselves that Jesus could be back at any moment. And in fact, he's dwelling with us in our hearts right now. So as we draw closer to the cross, we will live like he's coming back soon. God knows if we're, if we're serious about this, Christians will not be perfect. It's not about, oh, I guess I'll never sin again and I'll always do righteousness. No, but if we truly are his children and we're seeking after God, he will slowly transform our hearts. And we're going to have the same burdens that he has. And we're going to see someone hurting and say, I, I saw it. I've got to meet this need and bless them. And as a body together, we'll be able to do that. Now, on Wednesday, Jesus comes and teaches in the temple, but the Sanhedrin is over it. So they start to plot to kill Jesus. They're like, he has to be stopped. And so they're trying to figure out, how do we do it without the crowd revolting against us because he's popular? Well, in the middle of all this opposition, Jesus receives such a beautiful sacrificial gift. We're going to spend some time looking at it. A woman comes and gives expensive perfume to him. Judas is angry about this. Why? Well, he wanted her to sell it and give them the money so they could give it to the poor. Eh, he wanted to steal. Judas had stolen from the disciples' money bags, and he wanted to do that again. So Judas is so angry, he goes to the Sanhedrin and says, I will deliver him to you. How much money will you give me? They said, 30 pieces of silver. And so he sells his soul for 30 pieces of silver. He's the criminal of this day, but someone was in tune with what was happening here, and it was a woman in Bethany. It says, while Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume. It was spikenard, not really trending today, but very expensive back then. She poured it on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. And this, this blessed Jesus so much that we're still talking about it today. He, he included it in his gospel message. She did something that some people would say was wasteful. You don't take the most expensive thing you have and give it to Jesus when it could have been sold for, for food and for other things that are practical instead of just pouring it on his head. But what did Jesus say? She did a beautiful thing to me. This is always how it's going to be when the Holy Spirit tells us to be sacrificial, whether it's with our resources or, or our time, whatever it is, other people are going to think it's a waste. People, are, people aren't going to get your relationship with God if they're not that close with God. They're going to think, oh, that's too sacrificial. That's too much. Why would you do that for the Lord? It doesn't make any sense. Just be balanced, kind of be mellow in your relationship with God. But if you have a close relationship with the Lord and you know how much he loves you, you will overflow with love for him. This is a perfect response to what Jesus was about to go through, right? Her sacrifice and her love. In 1 John 3, 16, it says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brother's and sisters, as we think about the cross and the sacrifice that Jesus made for us and for the whole world, it becomes a little bit easier to be sacrificial. As we draw close to the cross, the idea we have of, of selfishness and just kind of our little world, it doesn't work anymore. We realize Jesus died for us and for the whole world, and we need to be thinking about his kingdom, not just our little world. Now, it's the sacrifice that Jesus made that inspires us. When Shannon was getting closer uh, with our second child, Gideon, to giving birth, all of a sudden everything was shook up and we realized when she went to a, a morning checkup that we had to have a C-section that day. So Shannon calls me in tears, you know, oh, it's happening today. And so we start getting ready, we go to the hospital. Now, up until that point, Shannon and I were arguing 
about the middle names. We argue about the middle names for all of our children for some reason. And so I wasn't budging, and she wasn't budging. She wanted to name Gideon's middle name Andrew. I'm like, you can't give away my name. It's my name. I have the, I have the rights and the royalties and the copyright. It's my name. It has nothing. And I wanted to name his middle name John because John's my middle name. It's my dad's middle name. I think it's my grandpa's middle name. So I'm like, it's just, it's like a rule, I guess, in my family to name the middle name John. And so, so we're arguing all the way up until the delivery. Then I'm sitting there in the room as they're slicing and dicing her and removing organs. I'm like, please put those back when you're done. And they take a baby out and they start putting, putting it all back together. And when they, when they brought Gideon to me, I said, his name is Gideon Andrew Dean. Because woman, after everything you just went through, you can name him whatever you want. It has nothing to do with me anymore. It has to do with you, you did all the sacrifice. What does it have to do with me anymore with what just happened to you? I'm just glad she's alive. And, now, I've got to be honest with you. First service, without any realization until I was talking with someone on the patio, I got my son's middle name wrong the whole time I was telling that story. I was, I was sharing the story, but with Titus's middle name, and it took somebody else to remind me. That's not Gideon's middle name. His middle name is Andrew, like I said this service, but last service I was saying it was Blake Dean or whatever Titus's middle name is. And so I just want you to know that I, I, I get it. I'm upping my coffee intake accordingly to make sure this doesn't happen as much in the future. Either way, the story still works. As, as we see the sacrifice of Jesus, it becomes easier for us to be sacrificial. Now, on Thursday, this is like the longest day for Jesus. I don't think he even goes to sleep on this day. It starts with him asking his disciples to make preparations for the Passover. Uh, that night, as they have what we call the Last Supper they had together, he institutes communion. We'll be having communion on, on Good Friday this week. And so they're having a meal together. It's in an upper room, and so we call this long conversation the upper room discourse. Afterwards, they sing together, and they head to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he begs his disciples to stay awake and pray. It's late at night. They're all falling asleep all the time. And ultimately, he's alone, pouring his heart out to the Father as Judas comes to betray him with the guards, and he's arrested uh, and betrayed. So this day, it all begins to head towards the cross. Now, in that upper room conversation they're having, there is a, there is a topic that surprises me moments before Jesus is crucified, and it's all about service and servanthood. It says that Jesus got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. Do you understand what I have done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, and you're blessed if you do these things. I believe Jesus could have created the world and saved the world without this moment of washing the disciples' feet. It was customary for this to happen. It should have happened. Somebody in the house should have done this. One of the disciples should have realized nobody's washed our feet. This is customary before the meal. There was a need that Jesus and the disciples noticed, but only Jesus met that need as he stooped down as the king of kings to wash the feet of his disciples. It's mind-blowing. So you think, Jesus didn't have to do this, but then you realize, well, if God is a servant, then he did have to do it because it's who he, he saw a need and nobody was willing to meet it, and so Jesus met that need. Even though it was lowly, even though it was the, the lowest thing that could be done, Jesus did this and taught his disciples, all of us, all of us are servants. You're not greater than your master. They're like, of course we're not greater than you. You're the son of God. And yet the son of God served We've got a, a great event coming up called the, the Father and Child, you know, Camp Out, Camp Out with Dad. You can sign up on the website where we go. We camp, you know, on the, on the sports field. It's, it's great. It's a lot of fun. Last year, when we put it together, Cornerstone's done it a lot, but it was my first time, and so I didn't have all the details down, so I didn't schedule anyone to help me clean up in the morning. And as the dads are all leaving, everyone's tired. There's trash everywhere. I'm like, all right, well, it's okay. I'm not going to inconvenience anyone. I'll just start cleaning up. Two other guys, without being asked, just started cleaning up the sports field, and they have kids that are saying, let's go home, let's go home, but they stayed and cleaned up for, I think it was like two hours. 
They kept on saying, what now? What now? I'm like, no, I'll go home. They're like, no, what else can I do? They must have shaved two hours off of me being able to go home because they saw a need and they, and they met that need. We have a God who serves. He has proven his service for us. And so we get to look for opportunities to serve. And as we draw closer to the cross, we will look for opportunities, whether that's joining a team here at Cornerstone or serving more at home or in our neighborhoods, we will be servants like God is. And so we've talked about five themes that Jesus knew he was talking about right before his crucifixion. The theme of expectations. What is our expectation of our relationship with God? And if it's too me-focused and not enough about his kingdom, I need to read the Bible and realign my expectations with God's. Or maybe it's this idea of cleansing. And we realize that even though it's embarrassing and, and hurtful and, and tearful to confess our sins, we don't want to admit it. We don't want to say it's as wicked as it really is. If we bring those things before God, he is faithful and just to cleanse us of our sins and all of our unrighteousness. He'll do it. And we need to invite Jesus to cleanse our hearts, his temple of our sins. Or maybe it's this idea of readiness. If we're honest, everything in this world seems designed to distract us away from the cross and the second coming of Jesus. How often do we forget, wait, Jesus could come back today? That's in the Bible. I'm not, I, the Bible even talks about people that are going to be caught off guard because they weren't expecting Jesus to come back. Maybe I need to be more prepared. How do we do that? Well, it's by living like he already is back, like he could be back today, meeting those needs that are around us. Or the sacrificial theme. A woman who gave everything that she had just to show love to Jesus. Everyone else thinks it's crazy. Maybe the Lord is calling us to sacrificial living or servanthood. God wants us to, to follow his lead, his example, and serve those that are around us. As we draw closer to the cross this week, as we get closer to Good Friday, I imagine the Holy Spirit is making at least one of these themes prominent in our minds and reminding us, yeah, this one's for you. This one's for me. This is what I need to be thinking on. You saw on the slides, there's a link. Go to cornerstone.com slash Holy Week where the, the Holy Week scriptures are compiled. And so you can look on there and it'll show you in the four gospels what happened on Sunday, Palm Sunday. What happened the next day on Monday? And you could read along this week, sinking your heart to the gospel story in this part of scripture that most of the gospels are about this week. You get, you get a, a good amount of details on the three and a half years of ministry and then a lot about this week. I think we need to have a similar priority in our hearts of saying, this week, whatever it looks like, it'll be more time with Jesus, more time focused on these themes that he felt important enough to talk about in these last days before the crucifixion. And so I'm going to try and, uh, starting tonight, read these scriptures to my kids. Um, together as a family, we'll be following along this Holy Week and the link's there if you want to do the same. But I want us to process some of this now together, and so I've asked the worship team to come out and do a closing song for us and we're going to have a prayer team available. And you might come up here and say, this is the theme that, that I'm wrestling with. This is, this is what the Holy Spirit's speaking to me. Can you pray for me to be faithful? Can you pray for me to have the grace and strength to respond as God wants me to do? Or maybe it's a burden so big that you came in here and didn't even really hear much of what I said because there's such a burden, a difficulty in your life, and you want to bring that forward so we can pray for you. Give us the honor of praying for you as we sing this last song. So, Father in heaven, would you please make clear how you want us to respond this Holy Week? Lord, which of these, which of these topics, these concerns of yours should be our concerns? Make it clear and give us the strength to respond, Lord. We are blessed in our doing, not in our hearing. So help us to figure out what do you want from us this week? It's likely to involve more time with you, following and obeying you, which will lead to a greater blessing and more joy in our life. And so help us to do that this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand with me as we sing this last song of worship? And, and also please come forward so we can pray for you. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his one. strangely did 
in the light of his glory and grace. You were the one at the beginning, one with God the most high.
God, we are so grateful for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the blood that was shed upon the cross. And God, as we prepare our hearts for Good Friday and for Easter, as we step into this holy week, God, we ask that you would just be preparing our hearts every single day, God, for what you are speaking to us as we, in ways, take that journey, the journey that Jesus took every single day. God, we're grateful for what you spoke to us through your word and through your presence today. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We love you, church. You are dismissed. We will see you good Friday at 5 p.m.